Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Elaine Stiles. I'm an assistant professor of historic preservation here in the School of Architecture, Art, and Historic Preservation. And it's my pleasure tonight to introduce our speaker, Randall, um, at the Roger, in the Roger Williams University Architecture Lecture Series, uh, Randall Mason. Professor Mason is associate professor in the graduate program in historic preservation and in the Department of City and Regional Planning at the University of Pennsylvania School of Design. He's well known to his colleagues in the field of historic preservation for his research on the social, economic, and political aspects of preservation practice, an area of critical need in the field. His work in these areas include consideration of urban design, economic development, memorial practice, the history of the historic preservation movement, and interpretation of cultural values. And his books, The Once in Future, New York, Historic Preservation and the Modern City, and Giving Preservation a History, Histories of Historic Preservation in the United States, which is edited with Max Page, um, explore historic preservation as an element in urban design and urban social fabric, and of course are usually required reading for most historic preservation and urban studies students. At UPenn, Mason's work bridges scholarship and practice. He leads the Center for Research on Preservation and Society, which conducts applied research on the relationships between historic preservation and contemporary social dynamics. And he also serves as a senior fellow at Penn Praxis, the School of Design Center for Applied Research, Outreach, and Practice, which brings institutional design expertise into the community through practical and applied projects led by Penn Design faculty. Before joining the faculty at Penn, Professor Mason had appointments at the Getty Conservation Institute, the University of Maryland, and with our neighbors to the north at the Rhode Island School of Design. So please join me in welcoming Randall Mason. Thank you very much, Elaine, for the generous introduction. Uh, always a little embarrassing when you hear your, what you've done read out like that. Um, and to, to Hassan and Nathan and to others, I really appreciate the invitation uh, and the chance to uh, not just to talk about work, but to talk about work with people who are engaged in the same work. Uh, so um, uh, I'll try to limit the, the, the time that I talk between 45 and 60 minutes. You can come and, and pull me away if you need to, uh, if it gets, goes a little bit too long. Um, but the, the thing that's most um, exciting and most valuable to me about these experiences uh, is to hear your questions uh, and your, your responses to the, what I'm talking about. So I really do hope that we have a little bit of a chance for dialogue later on. So um, the, I guess the, the sort of central question I wanted to talk about uh, is historic preservation's relationship to contemporary society and to contemporary design. Uh, it, it's complicated and it's fraught uh, and it doesn't necessarily seem to be getting any easier or clearer or better um, but it's a really urgent question I think we all need to ask ourselves, whether we're coming to the, the topic of dealing with the inherited environment, as I try to generally call it, from the perspective of being a preservationist or a designer with a capital D, or a, a local an elected official or um, you know, professor in, in school, no matter what your, your sort of position is in the, in, uh, in, regarding these issues, um, there are, seem to be greater complexities um, as the days pass. So um, the, the, the structure I've, I've given to the presentation, uh, first I'll talk a little bit about preservation, and then I'll talk a little bit about design, uh, and then I'll talk about some of the, the actual projects that I've done recently uh, with colleagues uh, and students. Uh, and what I hope is that, the, that when I talk about preservation, some of the preservationists will turn a little sideways and say like, wait, that's not what I do. And then the same thing will happen with the designers when I talk about design, um, because I think that you know trying to to sort of step back and and reframe uh, what we mean when we think about preservation, what we think about design, um, is one of the ways that we can sort of locate ourselves and get a perspective that um, that we can um, both stand behind uh, sort of ethically and professionally, um, but also um, uh, frame a kind of set of responsibilities that. Uh, that means something to someone else. Um, that don't just mean uh, like that I like my work because it's my work, uh, but that we are, we're out there doing sub social good and, and public good. So what is, how many of you are preservation related, by the way? You don't need to be a student. Okay, how many of you are designers? Okay, how many of you are both? Good, 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 good. I like those people. Okay, so the, you're the ones I'll call on. Uh, uh, so what is preservation? So the the... The way I usually start um, such a discussion is what preservation is not, and it's not all about Penn Station, and it's not all about charismatic buildings, and it's not all about architects with a capital A whose names you all know. Um, 
the uh, and then I've written. Uh, um, Elaine kindly mentioned uh, previous work, and the the work that I've done in the history of preservation has mostly been aimed at kind of tipping over this cart that uh, that it's all about the kind of heroic political advocacy movements that arise in response to the demolition of a great landmark building, uh, and that's part of the story of preservation, and it has been for a long time, and it will be for a long time. But it's certainly not the whole story. Uh, and the, the whole story, there's, there's not just like a simple replacement. It's not just the fact that we've been interested in other things for a long time or that we are a political movement. Uh, a lot of people in preservation think of the of preservation as a movement. I think that's really problematic because we're not only political, we're also technical experts and we're also designers. And so it's, uh, you know, looking into history um, has clarified my view in some ways, but it's actually complicated it more. And that's, that's what keeps it interesting. So whether it's New York at the turn of the 20th century or any other uh, American or, 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 or other city around the world for that matter, uh, preservation always has a real kind of um, uh, um, uh, complex of connections to uh, the moment in which it's done. It's not just about looking backward and, and, and curating artifacts. Um, so to get more to what it, the kind of gist of preservation and, and importantly what, what people outside the field think of preservation, uh, I usually use the, the following two slides, and those I think at least one of you is a former student of mine, so you probably may have seen these slides. Um, the, um, one, of the th one of the impressions people have is that preservationists are basically taxidermists, right? We find the prettiest specimens, we kill them, we pin them to the board, we put them behind glass, we put tags on their feet to tell other people what they mean, uh, and then we, we just make sure that they don't change, right? And definitely don't touch them. Uh, and you know, we make a joke of it, but that's a really important part of what the preservation what preservation is about. And you know, we've actually named it the curatorial instinct. That's the curatorial tradition uh, in preservation is incredibly important. It's not as unchanging as people from outside the field think it is, uh, but it's uh, it, but it's very also limiting if you think about uh, all the other things that that preservationists aspire to do. Um, it's also just a really beautiful photograph, so it always you know, sort of perks people up. It's a photographer named Rosamond Purcell. Um, second part of the story is that um, preservation is also inherently and, uh, and delightfully political. Uh, this is a photograph, and I'm sorry that the label seems to have fallen off, uh, which I apologize. It's a photograph taken by Stanley Kubrick, um, who you may know from his other work. Uh, before he made films, he was a photographer, and this is in the collection of the Museum of the City of New York. The thing about this photograph that I think is relevant to this is that preservation is about fighting for a cause, for a movement, for an idea, for a building. And it's not just about the, a fight over a building, it's about the process of fighting. It's about the process of being political and being part of the mix in any city or settlement or landscape of who decides what things change and what things stay the same. Uh, now again, as with the curatorial instinct, there is an argument that uh, to be made that preservationists identify a little bit too strongly with this pugilistic impulse, right? That we're always spoiling for a fight. I mean, we always wanna say no to any proposal. Um, that's true a lot of times, but it doesn't capture by any stretch the, the range of political positions and strategies and, uh, and, and tactics that, that preservation professionals uh, use all the time. The last side note about this is that um, since this picture is really big, you guys can probably see this. They're both hitting e each other, and they're both smiling. So there's there's some sense in which they really enjoy being part of the kind of sport of politics. So um, I, I wanted to relate this back to what my day job is in teaching preservation at Penn. Um, we we try to to sort of follow through on these curatorial and political traditions um, by um, by. Uh, deploying them in ways that are very professionally relevant for our graduates, uh, and that means training people in technical um, areas of preservation, but also in the political areas of preservation, and everything in between, all the kinds of the academic traditions and epistemologies that one needs to be a conservator, uh, to be a, a community planner doing preservation work. So the technical stuff includes you know, actually going out and, and doing uh, analyses and treatments of, of uh, inherited buildings. This is a brick kiln in Montana that my colleague Frank Matero worked on for several years. And that's, um, Nathan, that's Laura Lacombe, and the second from the left second from the right. Um, and uh, this is a photograph of a summer project we did for a few years in a World Heritage Site in Montenegro, 
where the issues were, uh, were not the technical conservation or the architectural conservation of buildings, which was, which was handled exceedingly well. It was issues like how do we limit the number of tourists? Um, what do we do now that cruise ships you know, uh, drop off 600 Germans at a time uh, and we don't get any financial uh, payback from it? Um, where do we put a road? Uh, who do we have to involve? And so uh, it's very much more of an urbanistic and a landscape uh, problem. Uh, and the, the, so we, we teach around these as well. The School of Design is, uh, is everything really, it's, it's been a great place for me to work because it's really well disposed in terms of the, the range of disciplines in the school. Uh, preservation is one of five departments and it's very porous the way that students can move across departments. Uh, we, because preservation is not a discipline, uh, it's a field uh, that applies to, that, that uses the work and insights of lots of disciplines, we have active um, uh, partnerships with people in, in all the four other departments. The way, excuse me, the way that we do it, uh, the, the typical um, degree in preservation, the professional degree is the two-year Master of Science that we've now been uh, delivering for 35 or 40 years. We actually recently started a one-year post-professional degree for people who already are working, already have a design degree of some kind, uh, but want to pivot into more pre preservation-related issues. And we sense that there's a great need to do this or a great desire to do this, um, but to, to, to leave your practice for two years of full-time school is just unreasonable. So we're, we're experimenting with the, this new, uh, new way of, uh, of uh, injecting more preservation into other design disciplines as well. But back to the two-year degree, um, the, I, I mentioned a second ago to Hassan, to, I just want to talk about the different focus areas that our students um, uh, take on in the, the, usually mostly in the second year of their program because the, the, these five focus areas, uh, in our mind, capture the breadth of the kinds of practice that preservationists will be expected to do, so they align with professional opportunities. Um, but they also um, clarify um, the breadth, but also the boundaries of preservation as a field. So it, it handles everything from technical conservation to capital D design, um, but the, the, um, uh, the complexities of actually managing cultural and historical sites which means running a, a business or, or managing an enterprise uh, is a very different set of skills than you get when you're studying technical conservation. Um, and with preservation planning, although we have it in that one little box, it, that, that could mean real estate development, that could mean public policy, it could mean stamping permits in and in a, in a historical commission. So we try to get our hands on the complexity of the field by channeling it in these five ways. Um, and the, I'll go through the, actually, these are probably less relevant now because I've already talked about the charismatic and urbanistic split within the field. Um, but to, um, to, to show that we still care about charismatic buildings, uh, I always like to make the joke that like the environmental field has struggled with getting over the public's desire to preserve, to conserve only the charismatic megafauna, right? The pandas or the, the, um, the tigers or the, the elephants. Um, we have to get over that too, but we still have to conserve the, the charismatic ones. So you, for instance, you may have to learn how to draw an elephant in plan and in section. Um, as the, and this building uh, is near where I grew up at the Jersey Shore, so I always like to, Lucy the elephant. How many have been to Lucy the elephant? Great. And it, this, I'm sorry, this drawing doesn't capture the stairway where you enter into her back leg and walk up, <laughs> but you can. And on the, on the urbanistic side of the, of the, the spectrum, the, um, I, I always um, focus on the Main Street program invented in the 1970s by the National Trust for Historic Preservation and still going strong as a real turning point in a way, kind of a radical intervention in the preservation field. Because for the first time, uh, preservationists were organizing not around the, 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 uh, the curatorial care of a building, but around the idea of how do we preserve a town? How do we preserve downtown as a place to do business? Uh, and preserving the buildings are part of that, but by no means the central part of it. So it's a matter of business organization and marketing and uh, you know, running enterprise and, uh, and planning in, in all of its senses. Uh, so of course, you know, Main Street program is a preservation idea, but a wholly different sort from uh, the way that we think about charismatic buildings. So the, the kinds of, um, of buildings we typically work on now include everything from the typical charismatic buildings, the old Georgian houses of the rich white folks. Um, we now also study their slave plantations in Delaware, by chance. My colleague Aaron Wunsch, who I think some of you know, has uh, been studying that very carefully, as well as more modern uh, versions of charismatic uh, buildings like the Miller House in Columbus, Indiana. 
Stuff that I do tends to focus more on urbanism and landscape, so uh, neighborhoods in Philadelphia, of which there are many in desperate condition and need help of many kinds, uh, like Sharswood, uh, where preservation is really an affordable housing issue, first and foremost. It's about uh, making affordable housing work in uh, a heritage landscape and in a particular kinds of historic building forms, uh, but it's really about keeping the people who already live there uh, in their houses. And then, of course, as neighborhoods improve, other issues arise. And I, the, the image at the bottom, I did not paint it. I just took the photograph of it. Um, but gentrification is uh, you know, uh, alive and well as a political and a cultural issue in a lot of Philadelphia neighborhoods. And we, too, have to grapple with that. That's not somebody else's problem. And we neither caused it nor can solve it. Um, but we are implicated in, in all aspects of it. And to um, the, the last part I'll say about preservation particularly is that the, one of the next issues that I think a lot of my colleagues um, are working on or want to be working on have to do with variously called negative history or negative memory or dark history or sites of trauma, uh, which include um, uh, genocide memorials in Rwanda. The building on the left I'll talk more about later. It's a project I've been working on the last several years. And then the other, one of the other uh, issues that people all around the country have been talking about and will for a while, the Confederate memorials and the, 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 the moving or altering of those uh, because of contemporary political um, advances, I'll say. So now a few words about what design is. Um, always hazardous to do this and because I'm not a capital D designer, but I'll make a venture anyway. So in preservation parlance, usually this is what design is. Um, it's about these old white guys with long beards from other countries uh, and the, the argument that they vicariously had in the 19th century about scraping and not scraping or scraping too much or too little. Um, so this is, again, is a really important and abiding issue, but it's by no means a really um, useful definition of design um, for contemporary preservation. Uh, instead, I've turned to uh, thinkers like Herbert Simon, who uh, many of you doubtless know, who was a social scientist and a management consultant and a lot of things. He kind of ignored, I think he fundamentally ignored uh, disciplines uh, and sought deeper understanding about how things work, uh, how systems work, how organizations work, how universities work. Uh, and he thought a bit about um, engineering and design. He usually called it engineering, but uh, um, he came up with a definition of design that probably most of, a lot of you probably use or, or could recite. Uh, to, I can't recite it, so I have to have the, the slide up here. But it, he, he sets out an, an idea that design, um, again, with a, metaphorically with a small d, is something that everyone does because it's about, uh, as he puts it, uh, now I'm sorry, I have to read, and my glasses are not quite strong enough. Uh, everyone designs who devises courses of action aimed at changing existing situations into preferred situations. So time is absolutely crucial in this, but there's a very sort of general invocation about um, the, the, the kind of boundaries of change. Certainly they deal with the, uh, the environment in our sense, the environment in the broadest sense. And he goes on to talk about how fields of uh, management, business, architecture, education, law, medicine, all uh, uh, basically are formed on this, this, uh, this core idea uh, th that design is about transforming existing conditions into preferred conditions. That, kind of, that very, very broad definition of design, I think, is, uh, is not just a clever insight. I think it's a very useful one. I'm not the first one to think that. I have no empirical evidence that Jim Fitch read Herbert Simon's uh, work, but they were of the same moment. So I think there's, it's probably not a, totally a coincidence that the synoptic approach, quote unquote, that, uh, that Fitch um, captured in his teaching and his, uh, his work at, at Columbia and, the, and this, uh, this textbook um, was a kind of a, uh, a challenge that we have yet to really fully take up in the field. As you may remember, those, how many of you preservation students have already bought and read this? You will, or at least go in the library and check it out. Um, the, as teasers, there are chapters on e economics, there are multiple chapters on ecological uh, issues, and J Fitch wrote a lot about the environment. So it, it and politics and culture, uh, and how we deal with cultural difference. So the kind of proto ideas in this book from the 70s, it was really about ideas from the 50s and 60s, but it really, it, it sets up a challenge and, it, and, and in a way kind of justifies those of us who d identify as of the preservation field, uh, pursuing a more ambitious framing of our field based on a broader definition of, uh, of design uh, and also engaged with contemporary issues. Uh, I'm going to go through those to save a little time. 
um, the way that I tend try to think about um, the, a kind of a revised or, or, or critically rethought practice following the, the kind of path of people like Simon and Jim Fitch and others um, is to think about engaged preservation. Uh, now, as opposed to what is a good question. Uh, and I would say that my sense, my notion of engaged preservation is meant to, to supplement and complement and kind of to, to critique uh, what you might call technical preservation or, uh, or political preservation, any of, uh, from either purist kind of position, uh, or the kind of experimental preservation that has now um, arisen, uh, which is essentially uh, kind of an art form, uh, preservation as, a, as something that happens in a gallery um, to make a rhetorical point. I think all of those are really interesting uh, and useful and valuable in a certain way, um, but fall short, uh, ultimately, um, to the goals that I think preservation should should uh, should pursue as a field, which not only take advantage of the things at the top on top of the box, the creativity and spatial intelligence and research that we already do, and we've been doing for a while, um, but to also um, really um, uh, take up the the challenge of deeper knowledge about how systems work and and how to how change works, uh, to really put a uh, flag in the ground about this around this notion of public good, which is constantly under attack. Even before our current political moment, it was under attack, but it's really under attack now. And of course, not lose, fact, uh, lose sight of the fact that you know, the passion and advocacy and political wis wisdom is, is useful for, for whatever purposes. But this, this notion of engaging um, with contemporary social issues um, has, I won't say it's been absent from preservation, but it hasn't been as central as I would hope it would be. And so in the, the projects that I'll talk about uh, in the balance of my time, uh, the, the idea is that, uh, that those get foregrounded. The, the, the issues of the right now and the, the issues that are about conflict and contention um, uh, take a more central role, not to, to blot out or to replace issues about uh, you know, uh, material conservation and arresting decay. They don't blot out issues about you know, regulating buildings so that they don't change too much. Uh, it really just kind of tries to put those in different relation to one another. Uh, so let me just um, try to go through these in a relatively um, speedy manner and, uh, and hope for, uh, for some uh, good questions uh, to follow on at the end. So Eastern State Penitentiary, how many of you have been there? Great. Um, did you go for the Halloween scare or did you go for the daytime tour? Anybody go for the Halloween scare? Oh, good. That helps. When, that helps when to, you can explain it to others later. Um, so it's an amazing, um, for in many preservation perspective, it's an amazing landmark. It was built in the 1820s by uh, to Haviland's design. It was used as a prison from the 1820s to the 1970s when it was closed, uh, and it was the original um, spoke and wheel, uh, 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 a hub and spoke rather. Um, a prison design that was later copied uh, by some accounts 300 different prisons around the world. It was based on this idea of penitence that um, those who, um, who committed crimes should be isolated uh, and made to be alone with their thoughts and uh, to contemplate God's judgment of them, et cetera, et cetera. These were our, our Quakers, or our, you know, our peaceful Quakers that we love so much in Philadelphia had this really bad idea built a building to enforce it, and what it did was drove people insane. Uh, so they had to change the prison a lot uh, over between the, the original kind of penitent system and a number of other incarceration strategies uh, over, that were um, uh, tried over the years. Uh, I should also say that it's, it's close to, but not in the center of Philadelphia. It was originally built to be on the outskirts. The city, of course, grew around it. So this aerial um, uh, gives you a sense of its size. It's about 11 acres uh, in, within the wall uh, and uh, just a, a few minutes up the hill from Center City. So the original plan is on the left and the, the current plan more or less uh, on the right. And so you can see the numbers of additions that mostly um, uh, followed the kind of DNA of Haviland's plan, but, but in some ways uh, uh, very purposefully changed them. For instance, uh, one-story uh, wings were made into two-story wings. Uh, the original exercise yards, which were also for individuals to not, not encounter another person, uh, were later converted to lots of different uses. So there were some flexibilities taken. So in the mid-'80s, a group of preservation advocates um, uh, organized to, to save the building uh, and realized that they not only um, uh, they didn't just need to save it because the city owned it and was thinking about selling it for 
to make it into things like a shopping mall and a supermarket. Believe me, there are actually drawings of how you put a supermarket in there uh, without uh, demolishing the wall. Um, but the, um, th their biggest um, uh, mission initially was to, uh, to get people to visit it. Because once you get people inside the building to, to appreciate its, uh, the power of its idea uh, and, the, and the tragedy of what happened to people inside of it, that was, is what, where the meaning resided. So they, they got uh, hard hat tours OK, and they began to take people into it. So um, that was 30 plus years ago. I've been on the, the board of directors for about five years and uh, was a, an advisor to them before that. So I've, I've only come in in the last several years. But the people who were the initial advocates are still run the organization and is fantastically successful, not just as a preservation organization and not just as, a, as an economic enterprise because terror behind the walls produces a lot of income to fund the preservation work. It's also become very successful as essentially a social reform institution, as a place where people go, they don't go to learn about the issues of mass incarceration, but when they go, they also learn about the issues of mass incarceration and racism that are not only national issues, but are particularly acute issues in Philadelphia and even in the surrounds of, of the, in the actual neighborhood of, the, of the, uh, the prison. So the conditions that you find are, are usually described as a stabilized ruin. Uh, uh, things of the decay has been mostly arrested. New roofs have been put on everything, which took something like 15 years to get the roofs repaired. Um, there is a, a, a bit of sort of artistic um, uh, influence in the curating of moving artifacts around to make interesting sort of combinations. This barber chair was never in a cell, but putting it in a cell makes you know, provokes certain kinds of, uh, of thoughts. Um, there are other kinds of preservation strategies that have been used over the years to, again, to bring the, the building and the, the whole place to life in different ways for different audiences. Uh, on the left is Al Capone's cell, and on the right, a synagogue. Both of them restored, um, if not totally reconstructed, um, and totally not in keeping from, in the terms of preservation philosophy with the rest of the building, but very sort of small and, uh, and bespoke kind of uh, micro experiences within the whole complex. And because the complex is so bloody big, and because there's so many rooms, and it's relatively spatially confusing and when you're in there, um, they can get away with doing different things in different spaces in a, in a, way, in a way that many other kinds of architectures wouldn't allow. So this is a, a sort of before and after uh, from a master plan that was done a few years ago, preservation strategy before and after. We're still actively thinking about how we preserve the building and connect that to different programmatic opportunities. Um, opportunities that are both economic uh, and social and also artistic. I would say that one of the biggest um, sort of transformative decisions made about uh, this preservation project was when they decided to invite artists in to uh, interpret whatever they wanted to interpret in the space of the prison. Um, so whether it's um, Jesse Crimes on the left um, interpreting his life as an incarcerated prisoner, um, Cindy Stockton Moore on the on the right doing an exhibit about victims of uh, of murderers who were jailed here. There have been dozens of these projects over the years, and uh, annually there's a, a, a call for artists. I think it's actually open right now if any of you also have artistic uh, ideas. Um, and so it's this constant refreshing of, uh, of new ideas and, and provocations um, that are loosely connected to the whole interpretive program, um, but really effective at getting people thinking in different ways uh, about this not just being an old building that is an artifact left behind that they can go look at it fall apart. And then, of course, there's the terror behind the walls um, that it, you know, remains, I won't say controversial, but it remains a constant uh, subject of discussion within the leadership of uh, Eastern State Penitentiary, Inc. Um, be, to make sure that the relationship between the, the Halloween scare and the interpretation of the, of the architecture and history and the social issues um, remain distinct enough that people don't confuse, confuse one experience for the other. So we can have a long, long talk about that and I'd be glad to field questions about that at the end. But I do want to certify that, the, the, that the, essentially the kind of surplus that is created by terror behind the walls goes to preserving the building. It doesn't go to, you know, we don't have board meetings in Aruba or we don't, you know, we, people don't get big bonuses. It's not, uh, it's not a profit-making venture. 
the most recent change, um, the, and, and for those of you who have already been, I would say go back now to see uh, a couple of new exhibits that very, um, uh, very directly uh, take on this issue of mass incarceration and racism. One is called the Big Graph, elegantly named. Um, it's a, a metal structure that sits out in open space and it shows over time the percentage of the population of the US that, uh, that is incarcerated. So you can see the increase decade to decade of how many people, uh, how many Americans are in jail. On the end of the, uh, let me see if this guy works. On the end of the most recent column, there's also room to grow. So in so subsequent decades, they'll put another one up. Um, in 2010, on that edge, uh, they're all the different countries of the world are arrayed by percentage. Uh, and on the back side of it, and we're at the top, by the way, US, uh, on the back side of it is a, a breakdown by race. Um, and so that was done subsequently when it was understood that we got, they got criticism that, well, this is a racial issue and you can't, you can't not talk about that aspect of it. So that has been um, very carefully uh, inserted into this exhibit. And then the, um, uh, the visitor feedback that we get is very carefully parsed for how people respond when we change the, the messages. In some of the old uh, exercise yards, um, uh, space was created or an uh, 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 re rehabilitation project was launched to create a big exhibit uh, called Prisons in the Era of Mass Incarceration that gives, it's a very, you know, a, a really well-designed set of didactics and, uh, and uh, interactive videos that give you a, a, not just a, a kind of a social overview but also a lot of first-person testimonies about the effect that incarceration has on contemporary Philadelphians. Uh, really powerful exhibit and uh, highly uh, recommended. Last thing I wanted to say about uh, Eastern State is that, you know, like every building, it continues to change and not just fall apart. Um, one of the things that we've been lacking for the last 30 or 40 years is bathrooms. There are no bathrooms. Um, there have been portageons uh, brought in for visitors. Quarter of a million visitors a year, no, no bathrooms. So this has been an urgent uh, need for a long time, and we're uh, in the course of, in the midst of um, see if I um, putting a new structure in here that will be uh, basically a visitor center uh, and bathrooms in this uh, old electrical um, facility, uh, and it's the first time that uh, there's been a decision to put a new structure of any kind in within the, the walls. Um, so it's been very controversial. It's been uh, controversial in a good way. There's been very vigorous uh, discussion about classic preservation design issues, like how much should it be differentiated from existing fabric? How much should it use the language of materials or the, you know, how background should it be? How forceful should it be? So we've been having, actually got an email this morning about yet another design change that, um, that uh, it's a very collaborative group. And so every decision is made. Uh, by, uh, by committee, um, so we hope that that makes a, for a better result. Um, this, is, this one is not happening, so don't worry about that one. Second project is uh, North Brother Island, uh, which hopefully none of you have been to. No hands? Good. Um, because it's off limits to the public. Uh, it's, a, it's an abandoned island in the East River uh, of New York. Um, and, and it's owned by the New York City um, government, the Department of Parks and Recreation. Uh, manages it and owns it uh, as a wildlife preserve. Although for between the 1880s and the 1960s, it was used as a hospital island uh, for quarantine and for drug treatment and for a bunch of different things. So it had this, this, this human history from the 1880s to the 1960s, and then it was abandoned. Nature has taken back over, and uh, among other species, the black-crowned night heron nests there, and because that's a protected bird, the island is managed as a wildlife preserve. Um, this is a contemporary photograph, uh, aerial photograph. Uh, North Brother is, sorry, here. That's Rikers Island, LaGuardia. That is a little corner of Central Park. And more importantly, these are um, several South Bronx neighborhoods, um, uh, Hunts Point, uh, Mott Haven, uh, and this is Randall's Island. Uh, technically, North Brother is part of the Bronx. Uh, and this part of the Bronx, as you, you can really just sort of tell from the air photo, is very underserved in terms of green space and environmental, uh, environmentally beneficial environments. So to have a, a city park 
basically part of the borough that's not accessible seems uh, politically untenable. And indeed, several politicians are really uh, lobbying to, to make it into a, a publicly accessible park. There are lots of barriers to doing that. One is that the birds are endangered and we, you can't, their, their nesting sites can't be disturbed. Second is that there's no infrastructure. Uh, third is that it's got a bunch of falling down old buildings on it that uh, will never really have a reuse um, and uh, present a real danger to people who might visit. Uh, so uh, that's the sign that welcomes you on the island, by the way. If, especially, it's on the side, I'm not sure why they put it here. This is on the side that faces Rikers Island. So I guess if you got in the water and you're a really good swimmer, you wouldn't pay attention to this anyway when you saw it, so I think it's kind of a wasted sign. Um, so we, um, we did a studio first in 2005, actually, um, on how to balance the nature conservation and historic preservation futures of an island that has the ruins of about 20 buildings uh, and, uh, and this really interesting and very disturbed uh, ecology. We went back and did a studio in 2015 and then got a, a foundation to fund uh, this study, which we've um, shopped around to a New York City Council. We have a couple of councilmen who are uh, uh, supporters, and we're, we're, we're fundraising now to actually design our uh, recommendations, which is to bring limited public access back to the island in a temporary way uh, to at least give partial benefit uh, to, uh, to South Bronx uh, uh, kids, mostly. Uh, to this this uh, this sort of amazing environmental asset in their midst. So this gives a sense of the, some of the surroundings, the land use. The brown is industrial, uh, pink is residential, uh, and the um, the aquamarine is uh, civic. This is the first map that we could find of the island, uh, which is really wonderful because the, it confirmed a lot of our instincts about landscape change and ecological change. Um, for those of you who are geomorphologists, it's a classic drumlin. Um, it's, you know, uh, it's got this sort of streamlined hill with wetlands on both sides. It's just a glacial remainder. Uh, the first hospital building you see there. Uh, and over time, uh, about 20 or 30 buildings were added. This is what it looked like after World War II. It's basically a campus, um, an institutional campus. Looks like it could be any sort of school. Uh, the land on the 20% uh, the of the land on the right side of the island is, is landfill. It was uh, subway um, fill from a subway tunnel project elsewhere in New York. Uh, but it, it, this uh, sort of scrubbed clean and, uh, and uh, lawn-filled campus um, was used after World War II as a town, basically. The state rented it from the city and housed 5,000 returning veterans who were on the GI Bill and going to universities in New York. So between 46 and 51, people took the ferry back and forth. It ran every 10 minutes. And, um, a friend and I published a book on this, and we got letters from people like, oh, I grew up there, and I took the ferry back and forth. My dad went to NYU. So it was, it was this very sort of interesting interlude when it was really intensely used and really connected to the part of the island, to the city, uh, totally changing the way that it was disconnected before. It was always valued as a quarantine place, and uh, among other things, um, Typhoid Mary was exiled there for, for decades. Um, so to, to have it totally connected uh, suddenly was a, kind of a transformational moment. But uh, after the 60s, the, the last uh, use of the island was for drug, uh, drug rehab for kids from uh, the Bronx and Upper Manhattan. Uh, that program failed, and the city just sort of let it sit. Today, this is how you approach the island. This is the, one of the old ferry gantries that uh, one of our uh, architecture students did a great project for how to stabilize this and essentially to make it into a, um, a kind of a sign for the, uh, for the island. The conditions on the island are, are, will be captured in these photos. These basically abandoned buildings that have lost their integrity uh, have been uh, taken over by the invasive species, whether it's maples or ivy or, uh, uh, or mulberries. There's half of a garage. Um, and these, these are photographs, and the, the photographer, Chris Payne, uh, took five or six years of amazing photographs in all seasons, and the two of us did a book together when I did a history, and he did the photographs, if you want to see more. The studio that we did uh, in the study included, um, doc we did a classic preservation study, documented what buildings were there. Uh, we documented landscape conditions. Uh, we documented building conditions. The little, I know you can't read this, but the pink boxes on the right were the only five of the buildings that we thought, with even with great investment, could be brought back to some use. And there are a couple of them that potentially, with a, with a big uh, price tag investment, could be reused. 
And then we did, uh, basically, we used, followed kind of, kind of National Park Service cultural landscape methodology to identify character areas and organize our recommendations around those character areas. Uh, and they basically break down to keeping it as a stabilized ruin and interpreting it, because it's not really interpreted other than the many, many websites of urban explorers. You can, you can, you probably may have already looked up on your phone. People who are not supposed to go there, go there anyway and take photographs and find ghosts and things like that. Um, to, to monitor the ecological resources, because as, as resilience and coastal resilience get to be more important issues, this place is a ready-made laboratory to understand the response of, especially of plant, different plant associations to, uh, to, to, to changing um, uh, maritime circumstances. It was totally overwashed and sandy, uh, for instance, and that had a big effect on even the invasive species. And lastly, and most interestingly, to bring limited public access, basically curated tours and, and, and educational experiences where we could keep buildings from falling over on people, uh, but also keep some of the buildings um, uh, up, uh, the ruins at least. Uh, so third project, um, uh, not too far away from here, Stamford, Connecticut. I'll go through this one relatively quickly because it's, it's, uh, it's still going on, so it's not finished, um, but it's also not a terribly interesting project. It's important, but not terribly interesting. The south end of, uh, how many of you know the south end of Stamford? Anyone? Great. Or anybody from there? Yeah. So it's this part of Stamford, uh, and it was traditionally, uh, at first it was um, this is a, a beautiful um, rural cemetery uh, and the big park at the end. It was country estates that looked in the water and became a big manufacturing landscape. The Yale Lock Company was there, Pitney Bowes was there, other big manufacturing and small manufacturing operations. So it became the kind of industrial part of town. Um, uh, but uh, in the post-war years, as the industry left, um, two things happened. It became a concentrated uh, place of uh, relatively poor populations and immigrant populations, and it also um, partly got redeveloped, especially in the boom years uh, of the 90s and 2000s, um, for new high-rise high condo buildings for people working in the financial industries, either based in Stanford or on the very quick train ride into Manhattan. So the, um, this is the, a map from the RFP, a really ugly map, sorry, from, an, from the RFP that the city issued um, uh, to basically to try to solve the problem of uh, the, uh, the yellow parts and there <coughs> and basically all that being high rise, new urban design um, with really bad street design and all automobile oriented and to save the blue stuff, which is the historic fabric. Now, what they don't color blue here actually should be color blue. That's the remnant of the uh, historic fabric that, that we're trying to defend uh, as part of a bigger scheme to allow more room for density for further development because the city needs and wants further density and development, um, but to protect enough of the urban fabric so that uh, it, is, um, it, it retains its integrity as a district and continues to provide affordable housing benefits. So this is a, a typical scene uh, of the, you know, the sort of heritage houses, which are nothing special, especially if you're from New England. It's you know, typical uh, uh, kinds of housing types, mostly wooden. Um, and then th this is just the intermediary scale, um, urban uh, new, new development. There's even bigger stuff when you get closer to the train station. Uh, I should say that, uh, that I'm the preservation consultant on a team that's led by a landscape architect named Ellen Nysis, uh, who has a practice in, in Brooklyn and teaches at Penn also. Um, and uh, and together we're we're uh, doing this uh, kind of a pro kind of urban design and preservation solution to protect buildings like this um, that are used uh, almost none of them used for single family housing um, the classic kind of main street buildings where there are there is a um, a, a, a hanging a business sector that's hanging on there. Um, and but mostly the affordable housing. This is my favorite picture because you can barely count the satellite dishes, um, and therefore the, the different apartments connected to different parts of the of the of the globe. Um, uh, that, uh, that this is basically the last part of Stamford where affordable housing uh, in historic buildings is still um, uh, viable. So this um, is, it is on the on the National Register. Uh, you might ask, preservationists may well ask, well, isn't it already protected? It's only on the National Register. There's no local preservation law. The politics have prevented it, which is pretty rare for Connecticut. Connecticut is usually pretty strong uh, at the local level for preservation. So this is a map from the 1986 National Register nomination. The red buildings have been demolished. 
This was the Yale Lock Factory, and they kept this one long building and basically scraped the rest of it clean. Uh, and oops, sorry. Uh, and you can see that uh, here, basically here is the area that we're focusing on most. Uh, go through that. But this is a close-up of that same area where you see um, this is, this is a, a still existing factory building, the Blickens Durfer typewriter um, uh, factory. You can't make this stuff up. Uh, the, you know, the, the, the charismatic old, old-timey name, the Blickens Durfer factory. Uh, and this is actually, which in the 1890s was a school, is now just a bigger school. Uh, and the, the, the crux of the issue for us has been to how to remake those blocks um, so that they, uh, they serve that role to connect the two existing bigger parts of the historic district, uh, but also create enough amenity that the developers will pay for part of it. It's basically like a user fee arrangement. Uh, and will also create public space that legitimately mixes these two very different populations that don't mix at all. The developers have made all these attempts at making public space that, are, that only serve the new buildings and really aren't public realm in any fundamental way. So we're trying to figure out how to get this green street of a kind of a string of public spaces. And one of the things that we're doing uh, that pushes the envelope with preservationists a bit uh, is to talk about moving buildings. Um, because moving frame buildings is actually a lot easier than we typically think it is. Post Sandy, there have been a lot of coastal communities that have moved a lot of buildings and lifted them at least and moved them around. So with some of the, the smaller and more kind of um, uh, marginal buildings that have already been kind of isolated, we thought that those could be moved into this zone and to sort of help to knit into the, uh, the existing in-place fabric. So um, maybe you take a look at the newspapers if you want to see how the fight comes out, but we're, we're close to being able to, uh, to give this proposal to the city and to see if they, if they take it up. Uh, fourth project uh, is in uh, a very strange part of the world called the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus. Um, it's a non-country. It's all, it, uh, part of the island of Cyprus. Um, it happens to have this uh, remarkable uh, town called Famagusta where the fortifications that were made between four and 900 years ago are still totally intact, uh, including the, the moat and the glacis and the gates. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the interior of the town is semi-intact, lots of new growth around it, but it's suspended in this, uh, this very strange political situation. It's right next to the demarcation line that's still, where the UN troops still patrol between Cyprus and, and the, Turkish, the, the, the Greek part and the Turkish part, so-called, uh, which since 1974 have been uh, at loggerheads. Um, but uh, inside the building, or, or, or inside the walls, rather, there are a number of remarkable church buildings and other landmarks that uh, groups like the World Monuments Fund has been working on for years. So the, uh, uh, through a Turkish colleague and a colleague at World Monuments Fund, um, uh, this, uh, we got involved in this project. WMF was already funding wall paintings conservation in one of the churches, uh, not one of the, that I pictured here, I'm afraid. Um, and it was amazing work and it's an incredible uh, uh, church building. But it, it struck me when I, um, when I first heard a presentation about it as conserving the deck chairs in the Titanic because you know, this beautiful church uh, would be totally overrun as soon as there's a political so solution to the, the Cyprus problem and investment rushes into this, uh, this amazing uh, landscape that not only is this the great um, uh, walled town, it's also a beautiful coastline, a Mediterranean coastline. Uh, so uh, whether it's for beach resorts or you know, uh, boutique hotels, um, without controls in place to protect the historic urban fabric and the, the landmark buildings and the walls and fortifications, it would be totally overrun and, and ruined by the, the, the development that, that someday, uh, if there is a political solution, will get unleashed. Uh, so um, let me just go through quickly a couple of atmospherics. This is the main gate. Uh, this, is, this is part of the, the Venetian-built fortifications that have recently been conserved. They're in better shape than now than, than this uh, picture suggests, but there's, there's their lion that the Venetians uh, very happily leave behind. Um, this is the, the, the moat, which is in, at least informally, I was told not to go there because it's too dangerous. You can't 
but there's an old guy on his morning walk. So people actually do use the landscape around the walls. So, uh, they're, they're, the, the, um, the authorities from outside Famagusta tend to think that there's nothing worthwhile inside the wall. It's just it's all like poor people and immigrants who live there, uh, and there's really not, no reason to preserve it. Um, all the valuable stuff is gone. Um, but if a closer look, or our closer look at least, uh, suggested quite the opposite. This is the most remarkable building uh, in the town, um, which is a cathedral. Does you notice anything strange about this cathedral? Hassan, you can't answer. Yes, sir. Right, it's a mosque, it's not a cathedral, so it has a minaret, of course. So the Ottomans um, took over Famagusta in the late 16th century, I think, uh, and turned it into a mosque. So it's been a mosque longer than it's been a church. Uh, it's just one of a, a number of remarkable buildings, this one being the one most visible, um, that have all these different lives over time and continue to serve the community extraordinarily well. So it's, it's really a matter of, uh, of understanding these places as sort of living, breathing, changing buildings and not just uh, you know, sort of curatorial elements. They've made a, a modern town square uh, around the, uh, the cathedral slash mosque, um, which again is the center of, uh, of civic life. A uh, number of other great buildings, including the, this is the church where they did the wall paintings conservation, uh, other m very early um, houses, later Turk 19th century Turkish buildings, ruins of all kinds all around town. So we did a, a series of studies with students to basically to document uh, what was happening in the town, vacancy condition, building type, uh, and so forth, uh, in order to make a set of recommendations about what would happen when, when change uh, of a very dramatic sort comes. And the last thing I'll say about it is that uh, maybe I had, should have had these slides earlier because the real opportunities that the big money developers from, uh, I guess you have to imagine they'll be Russians because they own the, the rest of Cyprus and they'll, they'll very quickly gravitate here. Um, this is the port uh, that is between the wall and the water and is currently controlled by the Turkish military. Turkish military have all the, the, the waterfront land. And once they leave, or are made to leave, uh, that opens up all this land. So not only the, the kind of 100% corner, uh, so to speak, of the town, but just south of the town is this um, suburb, modern suburb called Verosha, that in 1974 was quickly abandoned. Everybody got out because the Turkish military was invading. And all these buildings are empty, and have been empty since 1974. Um, there are a few of them, there are dozens of them. Uh, it's quite a big territory. It's, basically the, the dark um, seaside territory that you see to the right in this photograph. Um, they are, uh, some of them are used by the Turkish military, but otherwise it's this whole abandoned town. Um, I, we, we, we were not allowed and very greatly discouraged from going into the Verosha when we were there, but apparently some people have, like North Brother Island, people, you know, not being allowed in is a lure to some people, and so people have taken photographs of, you know, like the car dealership where the 1974 cars are still in the showroom, and, and people's you know breakfast table where they just like, like left and the, the meal is still on the table. So it's this real time machine, but that again will be like totally transformed by uh, the onslaught. The, the real preservation story though, and I think the development story is what happens to this thing that's still at the center, the walled town. Uh, as we know from uh, the kinds of um, urban development that's going on on in every continent these days, uh, that people realize the amenity value of historic landscapes and historic fabric, especially when it's so charismatic and so beautiful and so intact as it is in Famagusta. So we think it's one of those real you know, sort of time bombs that's going to blow up someday, and we, we can do uh, a lot to try to prepare for that. Okay, last project. Uh, several years ago, I, was, uh, um, I did a small project uh, with uh, some students on, uh, to do a study of a memorial in Rwanda. Um, with uh, an architect in New York who was doing a plan for its uh, kind of uh, conservation and renovation. Although they didn't have any conservation folks on their team, so we, we kind of joined them. Um, that turned into a, a two or three year project where, uh, in which we worked, uh, are working um, with the Rwandan government essentially to do training um, so that the people who manage their national genocide memorials um, have conservation expertise or at least exposure and as they manage um, the ongoing life of these memorials, um, they can factor conservation in. They really haven't um, in the past, except very kind of uh, idiosyncratically. 
background for this, of course, is that um, some of you probably know at least a little bit about the 1994 genocide, but the, 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 the starkest and operative fact is that in 100 days, 800,000 people were killed, and mostly killed by hand. Um, it was not like poison gas or bombs or, or even, uh, even guns. Um, so it was this incredible um, human tragedy. Anyway, you slice it, no matter what political side you're on. And it was essentially different classes within Rwandan society who victimized, uh, one victimized the other. They're often described as ethnic groups, but that's not really the case. They're more, it was more of a kind of a social and economic class difference. Anyway, th um, the, uh, the story after 1994 is remarkable in a different way. Um, how many of you, have any, any of you been to Rwanda? It does actually get a fair amount of uh, international tourists these days. Since 1994, the country has been remarkably turned around. It is regarded as, a, as the most successful, stable, um, uh, highly developed or quickly developing country in, in Africa, certainly in East Africa. Uh, and the, the, this, the, this incredibly resilient story of rebuilding Rwandan society, um, including bringing people to justice who were the perpetrators of the genocide and reintegrating them into Rwandan society at the same time that Rwandan society built itself up economically, that was all managed by a guy named Paul Kagame, who was the leader of the militia that stopped the genocide in 1994. They were in exile in Uganda, invaded the country, stopped the genocide, and basically became the political power. So it worked. Uh, they transformed the country. The downsides include um, political repression, a not quite free press, uh, reports of torture and, uh, and worse um, uh, as part of maintaining that political regime. So it's very fraught. It's an it's incredible story in all these dimensions, but also still incredibly fraught. Human Rights Watch um, routinely reports about what a you know, what an evil regime the Kagame regime is. At the same time, there are plenty of other people who, who hold it up as an example. The Singapore of Africa, of, you, know, it's a, you know, more repressive than it needs to be, but it works, uh, kind of uh, uh, um, you know, political regime. So um, having um, been invited to work on this, uh, for better or for worse, the, the strategy that, that uh, I and my team took was to, to focus on the, the people on the ground who have the day-to-day -day responsibility for keeping these places intact so that um, not only can they continue to be used by Rwandans today as part, um, unabashedly as part of a political campaign to keep the country together and even repress it, um, but in the, to make sure that these places were intact in the future so that as the the, 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 as Rwandan society continues to transform and the democracy matures, et cetera, et cetera, um, that these places would still be available for interpretation, for reflection, for commemoration. Because if they disappear, uh, then the prospects for a better Rwanda, I think, disappear with them. Uh, so we thought it was very important, even at a, the kind of technical, professional, uh, material level, um, to, uh, to, to help our Rwandan colleagues figure out how to keep these places together. And so, strangely, I found myself very engaged in technical conservation. And even stranger, engaged in technical conservation that's mostly about textiles, which, as you'll see in a minute, is the, the most urgent problem with this site. So this is the, the sign that you see um, as you're passing on the main road uh, through the town of Niamata. Uh, the memorial is just off the road. It was built as a Catholic church, as you'll see in a moment. Um, it's, uh, incidentally, it's the main road that you see here behind the sign. In a couple of years will be the main road connecting a new airport to the capital. So the amount of traffic on this road will increase uh, exponentially, putting more pressure on the town and, of course, the memorial. Um, there are lots of ways that the, um, that the Rwandan genocide is already memorialized um, in literature and in writing, uh, in artworks, uh, in uh, archives that the Rwandans and their uh, partners, in this case a, uh, a UK-based um, uh, trust called the Aegis Trust, helped them build uh, an archive of survivor testimonies and first-person accounts uh, and transcripts of uh, this extraordinary 10-year uh, transitional justice effort that are they were, they were called uh, Gachaka Courts, uh, essentially means grassroots. And it was basically a decentralized justice system where people would come forward in village, literally around the village green uh, and admit their crimes. 
uh, and apologize and be um, not absolved, but um, but um, to sort of get a reduced sentence or otherwise be reincorporated into society. So this remarkable sort of you know coming clean uh, to each other. The transcripts of every one of these once a week meetings in every village for 10 years has been digitized, or is being digitized as part of this remarkable archive. So the memorials are part of an, a bigger effort to, uh, to literally archive and metaphorically archive um, evidence of the genocide. Uh, and again, what happens with that evidence is a political question that is, to be perfectly honest, that's the next question I have to deal with in, in my, this work in Rwanda. I really haven't figured that out yet. And that's the, you know, the next book that I write is gonna be about figuring out what this means for the, the kind of political futures and what our work and my work means in, in sense of these political futures. But I'll talk next more just about the, the, the on the ground work that we did at Niamata and then I'll wrap it up. So um, Laura Lacombe again, Nathan and I both know her. She was a Penn student and studied uh, material conservation and was part of our, the team that we uh, took repeatedly to, uh, to Rwanda to do training and to, as part of the training, to do the conservation work and a conservation plan for Niamata. Uh, the woman on the right is uh, named Rachel Maratakeke. Uh, she's the manager of Niamata, the, the, the genocide site. Um, she grew up uh, in the region and her family, uh, she's a survivor of the genocide and her family uh, was dispatched at Niamata. Um, and many of the people who manage the sites and work for the government agency that manages them uh, uh, have personal connections to the sites where they work and often incorporate that into their tours. The tours are the only way that the sites are interpreted. There's no brochures, no signs, no films, no, uh, you know, uh, it's just the people and the artifacts. So it's this very um, kind of uh, clarified, straightforward experience. Um, <clears throat> my most important collaborator over the, these three years has been Martin Muhoza, uh, whose family was also dispatched at Niamata. Um, remarkably sent him out of the country just in time in uh, April 1994, so he was spared. Uh, but as soon as he came back and tried to find his family, he uh, became involved in the, the response, the post-genocide response um, in, in the most you know, literal way of um, separating human remains from artifacts and to begin the process of uh, preparing these sites as memorials. Uh, most of the, memor the national memorials are sites of these very intense killing, not all of them are. Um, the structure you see over Martin's uh, right shoulder uh, with uh, the roof on the, on the left here is a mass grave structure. Each one of the national memorials has a concrete vault mass grave structure in which the human remains are, are kept. Uh, off, uh, off of public view, but you can go into the vaults to view them if you like. Or if you're a survivor and want to go see the remains of, uh, of your people, you can go in and, and witness them per, uh, personally. Uh, Martin has been, since 1994, involved in one way or another in caretaking, keeping, keeping care of these sites. Uh, and he's now the, um, the kind of the, the chief of the site managers and conservators uh, for uh, CNLJ, which is the government agency that, that manages the sites. He is trained as a school teacher uh, and in biology, and he doesn't have any conservation or design or engineering training. He's been uh, figuring it out as he goes along and has done a remarkable job of one man with a whole country of sites to, to manage. Um, but he's principally who we're working with, uh, and the 12 people who work under him are our, the, the kind of students in our, our training program. Uh, this is the site itself, uh, and sorry, it's not a great image, but the, the, uh, the church building is right there. That's the main road, uh, and this is the property. That's the new church because the old church was deconsecrated when it was turned into a memorial. And this is kind of a little enclave of religious um, uses, schools, convents, um, uh, rectory, uh, and, and the newly built church. Uh, so it forms a little kind of quiet square off the, the sort of uh, cacophony of the main road. Um, a quick aside into architectural conservation and architectural history, the building itself is a really remarkable design. Uh, it was built, it was designed in 1980 and built shortly thereafter by a Swiss architect priest uh, who was a missionary to East Africa. Uh, his name was Bernard Jobin. He's still alive. We've, uh, we've interviewed him. Uh, in this, happily, we found this in a Swiss architecture journal. Um, the church is uh, ma made uh, essentially of uh, very simple masonry construction. 
uh, with a metal roof, uh, passively ventilated and passively lit, beautifully, um, beautifully designed to be part of its environment, low tech, all local materials, no advanced technology, um, more than, no, nothing more advanced than concrete. The building includes some really uh, interesting references, including uh, Romanesque arches on this interior elevation. Uh, and uh, if, you, if I didn't tell you where this was, you might say, okay, this was like a third-rate student of Corbusier. Uh, and it sort of was. Um, so he, it, the literal Corbusier references of the, the sort of pinwheel plan where he pulls apart the building in these different spots to um, and introduces concrete screens for passive ventilation. And as you'll see in some of the pictures I show of the interior, there's a reference to Ranchamp. There's a, a, a space between the top of the wall and the, um, and the roof structure where there's a thin uh, line of light. Um, uh, so it's, it's, it's a very, very rich building, uh, in, even, even just architecturally. Uh, this is the, just a typical wall to give you a sense of the, the local material. Um, pretty badly made brick, but serviceable, but badly made. Uh, and the mortar is, uh, more con is concrete, basically. So architecturally, the conservation strategy has been, and, and we've just continued this, to leave intact any damage that's from the genocide from April 1994, like the bullet hole on the left, um, but to remove and remediate and to arrest the decay that's coming from other vectors, including birds uh, nesting on the building and uh, whose excrement is, uh, you can see on the right. So some of the uh, pathologies of the building we eliminate and others we essentially have to keep intact because they are the most significant part of the architecture. This is one of the, uh, one of the screens, uh, one of these sort of ventilation screens. There's, there's no barrier. The, the uh, air and wind and pests and everything else can go in and out for better and for worse. This is the tower at the back um, which uh, proclaims its uh, role as a Catholic church. From the interior, this is looking up at the ceiling where the bullet holes from 1994 have been preserved, really um, cleverly by putting a, a cle an almost clear fiberglass layer on top of the metal roof. Very light, it's a very light metal structure, so the light fiberglass has, uh, has worn really well. Will need to be replaced soon, and that will be a challenge, but this is a really wonderful way to keep the damage intact and actually to sort of highlight it. Uh, it's a mass grave structure. The, the interior, this is the interior of the church, what you see from them, there are two entrances, and the main entrance um, gives you uh, the immediate view across this one large room to the altar. This is the tabernacle at the bottom of that big tower that's open at the top and sort of admits this beautiful light. There's a baptismal font. Uh, these are the, the light aluminum um, structures that hold up the roof. This is a, um, uh, a crypt structure that was made in uh, 1996 uh, after the genocide as a, a way to display certain artifacts. And so this is a stairway that goes down. The thing that overwhelmingly um, impacts you when you walk into the room is, are the piles of textiles uh, everywhere. Uh, they are, um, th in this view, they're on top of every one of the pews in the church. And they are essentially the, the stand-ins for the missing people. When people came to the church, they were told to go there to be safe, to find refuge. Of course, that was a trick, and it only made them easier to slaughter in greater numbers. But they brought with them their clothes and household goods and whatever they needed. Um, so these piles of clothes are, were separated from human remains in the direct aftermath of the genocide and have remained here for the last 24 years, sitting there in a passively ventilated building and deteriorating more and more quickly as the years pass. Um, it's bad enough when they're on pew benches, lifted up off the floor a little bit. Uh, in other parts of the church, this is the, 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 the day chapel at the back of the sanctuary. These are all just piled on the ground. Uh, and so we quickly realized that the building was in quite good shape and didn't need any really dramatic uh, uh, interventions. Um, there are some water infiltration issues, but those, can be, uh, those are sort of slow burn and can be, can be dealt with pretty simply. Uh, but the textiles were urgent. If nothing was done, they would be gone in 10 years. Uh, and so we had, a, we had a textile conservator as part of our team, a woman named Julia Brennan, who also has um, experience, among other places, in Cambodia, uh, working on some of the remains from the killing fields there. So she had a little bit of a, an analog to how to deal with this. Uh, and long story short um, is that we, we designed and prototyped a process for semi-cleaning the textiles bringing them up off the floor, 
uh, reducing their humidity and getting rid of the pests um, to, to just slow down the decay. You might think, well, why didn't we just go put them in a museum facility? Well, there's a Rwandan law that these artifacts can't be taken off the site. Uh, and we also didn't want to enclose the building and condition the building. It would be a disaster for the architectural conservation reasons. It would also be extraordinarily expensive and the electrical supply is not that great. Um, so we had to, to design a solution like Bernard Joban that was based on the existing um, low-tech uh, availability. This gives you a sense of what the different part, different conditions of the textile collection. Some of them are quite recognizable as garments. Other ones are so um, uh, either embedded with uh, laterite road dust um, or simply deteriorated. You can see here, like this is all just uh, eaten away uh, in, uh, and just uh, so dirty that you can't really tell what it was originally. So part of the challenge was in sorting out the different parts of the collection because they would be treated somewhat differently. Uh, and to, uh, to, to, again, to train the Rwandans not on the concepts behind the process, but also in the process itself so they could continue doing this work. It's a massive amount of uh, collection just at this one site. And every other site in Rwanda has its textile collection that is just piled up in a corner somewhere. So we, we uh, it took us a really long time to make this. Um, we couldn't use a drone either. Um, no drones allowed. Uh, the defense ministry says no drones, so no drones. Um, so we, we invented a way to, to take basically interior aerial photographs to map the, the, uh, the textile collection and to estimate its size, 39 cubic meters. Um, a, a big 18-wheeler shipping container is 40 cubic meters, so basically a, an 18-wheeler's worth of textiles. There are also some artifacts, um, rosaries and wallets and glasses and things like that, many fewer of those though. This is, a, sorry, a quick detour into the crypt um, where there are some human remains and artifacts on display in a glass case um, that has never been monitored. So here you can see Martin and Laura installing some really um, simple hobo devices to measure relative humidity and temperature just to get a sense of, of what kind of deterioration could be mitigated. Some of the interior architecture also needs to be dealt with um, for various reasons. But the textiles, again, are the, the overwhelmingly the challenge. Uh, this is Julia Brennan um, doing some of the sorting. This is a blanket. Uh, this is Martin um, uh, and Julia starting the sorting in the, the day chapel. Our goal last May and June was to completely process this room uh, and to redisplay it, uh, again, as a, as a training program. What we needed to do that, this is a, a map of the site done by Rwandans. Um, uh, th there's no place on the site to do the work, so we had to make a building. Uh, this, I, I, I joke to my friends that I'm not an architect and not, certainly not a trained architect, but this is my first built structure. So I basically had to design it in my notebook and uh, send it to a Rwandan contractor to build it out of sheet metal and posts. Uh, designed so that it could be dismantled easily and sent on to the next memorial site once they started work there. So it's essentially a kind of a, you know, sort of a temporary building. Uh, but it's on a concrete foundation. Uh, and so the, one of the things that we needed the building to enclose was this contraption that we had an engineer build. It's essentially a tumbler. So you put the clothes in, tumble them, a lot of the dirt falls out. Any of artifacts and human remains that happen to be left also fall out into the tray underneath. Um, the clothes that are totally deteriorated get um, put in a different stream uh, and uh, basically immediately archived. But the ones that are still recognizable get vacuumed. Again, in a, in a non-destructive way, they're put between two sandwiches of screen and vacuumed. Uh, and then put in these uh, plastic bins that are right out of a, uh, you know, a Home Depot type store with uh, zoolite beads, um, desiccant beads. Um, that soak up the humidity. So the most important thing to do is to get the pests out and to get reduce the humidity. So we um, put the clothes in with the beads and an RH meter, uh, and they monitor, the Rwandans monitor, when it gets down to a certain humidity level, then they can swap them out for a next bin full of clothing. The, um, the zoolites uh, are sustainable in the sense that once they're used up, you just heat them and drive off the water, and then you can use them again. So they're kind of you know, like infinitely usable. They're usually used for, uh, for keeping seeds dry for uh, agricultural uses. 
So last two slides. This is before, and that's after. Uh, and so the, the, we had to create a kind of an interim um, display or interim interpretive uh, design. And what we decided to do is we had these um, metal platforms created that are sort of, they're three like, sort of like bed platforms uh, out of uh, all metal. Uh, and we redisplayed cleaned piles of clothes on the platform, as well as the bins of clothes that, that still needed to be monitored. So this gave easy access to the staff that they could record the humidity and know when to swap things out. Plus, it cleaned the, the day chapel and the, the continuing um, you know, supply of dirt uh, and, uh, and pests um, uh, and also needed to be um, uh, remediated right away. So the, the last picture that I would have shown if we'd done it already, I'm going back next week, and I hope that I'll have another slide to take, uh, is that all the clothes on the pews should have been removed, the pews repaired, because they're all wood on metal brackets, and they're all been eaten by termites, uh, the clothes processed, and then put back on the pews uh, and displayed the same way, so that if you went if you went back, you wouldn't be able to tell that they had been conserved. And that they might look a little bit cleaner, uh, but they'd basically be redisplayed in the same way. That was extremely important to the Rwandans uh, and to the survivors, that they, uh, the, that kind of wit direct witness to um, the, the loss of their, uh, their families um, is the, one of the most important things that they do every April when this um, 100 days of commemoration begins every April 7th. People come and spend sometimes days um, at, at this and other memorials remembering their ancestors. Um, they need and, and, and want these collections as the direct witness of the genocide. And so um, the, the, the technical work that we carved out was to make sure that, that they and future generations are going to have um, these textiles and this, this place to, to go back to. We know it's a very imperfect solution. We know that the decay continues. These are still exposed to most of the same vectors that they have been exposed to. Um, but this is the best that could be done right now uh, in order to get them on a path of thinking about conservation long into the future. So with that, I will take you back to Philadelphia and be quiet and listen to your questions. Thanks. And I'm sorry for talking for so long. So I, I find it hard to stop. Um, so in New York, was it Brother Island? Is that what it was called? Yeah, North Brother. Why, I guess my question is, in a situation like that that's so inaccessible, why even create a preservation, I guess, effort in that situation? Because it's like the public can't get hurt. Even if you have like these minor kind of trips to there, is, is, that, like, is that a feasible kind of investment, I guess you could say, for those five buildings? Um, well, we don't know what's going to happen to the buildings yet. We actually propose that some of them be torn down, um, because the most dangerous and most deteriorated ones, and have the, the materials reused um, in some way. So we're not actually specifying uh, which buildings need to be preserved, and they certainly won't be reused or rehabilitated um, in our lifetime. Um, we thought the rationale, the rationale rests on two things, well, three things. One is I mentioned that the South Bronx is dramatically underserved when it comes to green places, natural environments. Uh, and as they deal more with environmental injustice issues, like they have the highest um, uh, asthma rates in the city, et cetera, um, they, they, they want and need more environmental resources. Since they already own it and it's right there, they can see it but not get to it, it seems like a political imperative to give them access to it in some way. Now you could do that virtually. You could, you know, and there are there's there's one interpretive sign in a park on the shore that, that says, okay, that thing you can see, this is what it is. This is what happened there. So you could do it virtually, but we think it'd be more powerful if at least some people got the got the experience of actually being there, um, and especially young people. So that's one. Number two, the the social histories attached to it uh, that have to do with quarantine and immigration are really important and urgent. And we shouldn't just squander an opportunity to, to interpret those stories for, for current and future generations. And the third one is, is, is a kind of an abstract concept. Um, but economists have this, uh, this notion that part of the value of a, of a cultural good, an old building or an island, whatever it is, 
uh, is what's called its bequest value, uh, or its or its option value, and that is that you know it has a value because you might go to it in the future, or that somebody else in the future might go to it. So it's not your immediate use of it and personally your use of it, um, but that you value that the idea that someday somebody might be able to, to to make use of it, take take value from it. Uh, and so as, as a matter of bequest value, I think especially in very fast growing and transforming cities like New York, we should look very carefully at every bequest value uh, issue that comes up um, because it's a, you know, it's, we like to say it's, it's a scarce resource and that's right, you can't, we're not gonna make new North Brother Islands. We'll make other kinds of stuff and we'll sort of preserve those too. But this is, once this is lost, it's lost. Uh, going to talk about uh, Rwanda, uh, you were talking about how your how your solution is for conservation, especially of the uh, personal goods, which seem to be the stuff that the uh, families are most interested, are prioritized the most, value the most. Uh, that eventually, simply because of the of the climactic and biological conditions, they're going they're going to decay and disintegrate uh, at some point. It's probably within the lifetimes of the survivors of the genocide. Um, is are a lot of your discussions with the people that work on the site um, talking to them about how to manage that process when people come to visit their families' remains. Do you mean that people might actually physically touch them? Uh, or just in general? Just it? in general of like preparing the people who work at the site for the fact that, you know, the, 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 the textiles are gonna go. Yeah, so absolutely, That's that was sort of like day one of the training, like the, everything falls apart, like things fall apart, the famous, famous book, right? Um, and it's not a matter of um, stopping that altogether, but managing it. And you, all of our interventions are about managing that decay. <clears throat> um, there are ways to manage it more aggressively and less aggressively. And they've been doing a little bit, but not that much. Um, so we're just sort of like, we're moving the lever. That's how we, you know, we sort of talked about it with them. Um, so we did, we, we did propose a bunch of ideas to them that made sense to us, but they're just, they're not acceptable for various reasons to, to the Rwandans or to, to say in Alger, who is, you know, to, to, they're our client. We act, they're actually not paying us, or mon the money is not coming from them, but that's who we're working for. Um, but you know, one of the differences between, I talked earlier today to a class at Brown, one of the things that, that you know, um, there's always that moment as a teacher when people start writing things, you realize, oh, you must have just made an important point because somebody, they wrote something in their notebook. I said, it's like, you know, working professionally, um, we can talk about like the philosophy of how we do this or that, um, but once you have a client that's part of the mix, it doesn't make the philosophy go away or less important, but it adds another really important influence that changes the shape of everything. Uh, and so th what saint Alger has to do politically, financially, and just um, you know, bureaucratically are part of the constraints we're working with. So one of the things that, they, um, that they, we, we couldn't do, we couldn't remove things from the site. We still put in our final report that the best solution um, we thought was to drastically reduce the amount of, uh, of textiles on display and to take X percent, you fill in the blank, uh, and to archive them off site in Kigali uh, in, a, a, in a conditioned uh, facility. Um, and that would be basically, we'd have to change their law to do that. We said, you should change your law because that's, that's the best way to guarantee that you can um, display them and interpret them and commemorate with them as you are and have the possibility of doing that in the future. Because otherwise, you know, in 10 years or now, 50 years, I don't know, how many years did we give them by, by extending uh, the life of these things? They have more, but they don't have an infinite number. So we've tried to make them aware of that, but also respectfully give them actionable recommendations um, that they can, they can do right now and, and will work. Thank you. I actually want to ask two questions. Um, the first one is, I, I'm trying to connect three dots. 
and I, I can get the first two pretty well, but maybe you can help me with the third. Um, and the second question is actually about your thoughts about Cuba, because when you were talking about Cyprus, I think about how Cuba is changing so rapidly, and I kind of want to get there myself before it's gone, um, because it was kind of a, a time capsule for a long, a long time. Um, if, just to get a few observations about that. But my first question is, the first thought is, um, a long time ago I was listening to a story on NPR about a woman, I can't remember if she was a therapist or a clergy person, but she, her job was to take people and even children to see um, the, the bodies of the deceased. And, and there was this story about a girl who wanted to see her brother shortly after he died and the family didn't want her to and they, they thought she couldn't handle it. And you know, she went in and she talked to him and, and you know, she brought him a flashlight so he wouldn't get rid of the dark. Um, and it was, it was beautiful and it, it helped her cope and it helped them cope. And um, in looking at the chapel in Rwanda, I, I think about, you know, all they have is clothing, but it's, it's something. So that's two dots. And the third dot is, it's just historic preservation in general, that it's, it's not the body of your deceased sibling, it's not the clothing of, of your, your genocide victim relatives, but, but history somehow, if we can still touch it and connect to it, it helps us process and I guess that's the third dot and maybe you can fill that in for me a little bit more. I think you gave yourself a good answer to your question. Um, I won't say anything about Cuba because I've never been there and have not studied it, so I, I would be interested to hear others talk about that. Um, but uh, for the, you know, I think the, the last point that you made, the third dot, um, is that the, you know, the sites where things happen matter. You know, the, the, the term, of, the, the popular term is that place matters. Uh, and we say that so often, I think we forget exactly what we mean by that. But, you know, whether it's, however you term it, you know, that the specificity of a thing happening in a place at a time to people, um, that we can, we can make those connections and that they're meaningful to us. Um, that's, you know, and I think we need to um, uh, st study that ever more deeply to understand how that works for people uh, and to, um, to honor it. Uh, and I think we all have uh, personal instances where, you know, something might not be, you know, something that's meaningful to the whole society, but it's a place where you did a thing. And that's, that location is going to be meaningful to you no matter what's there now. In the classic tour, when I was, when I, early in my career, when I worked as a, as a preservation and planning consultant, you know, one of the kind of jokes was that, like, you know, one of the tours you always get when you go to work in a new town is the older person who gives you a tour of the things that are not there. Like, that's where the factory used to be. That's where my school used to be. That's where, and that, when I, I start to hear, I'm, I'm eligible for the National Register now. Um, when I start to hear myself do that, it's true. It's like, you know, and that does, in a way, um, it's kind of funny, but it doesn't matter because, you know, I know that that was my school and I have a memory attached to that location. And that's still legitimate to me. So the, um, dealing with that in a, in a more robust way means that we have to get away from some of the material concepts and theories that are still at the center of our field to go back to the beginning of the slide talk and, you know, Vile and Ruskin. Um, you know, the, the material authenticity is an important concern. It's not the only concern when it comes to making decisions about, uh, about preservation. Um, so we have to, uh, to allow <clears throat> and then also theorize how things like, uh, you know, the authenticity of experience matters. Um, and matters at in different scales, individually, families, schools, countries. Um, we have we have so sociological theory to back that up, but we really haven't reckoned with that as a as a design issue. So I think that's under the banner of engaged preservation. I think that's one of the things we need to work. Um, so I just wondering about the oh. sorry, she had her hand up first. So. Oh. Sorry. Uh, so. Well, you, you did a few dark heritage things, and I'm just curious. So, dark heritage is a pretty considerable um, subcategory of preservation. Um, I mean, it touched on a couple of the topics that you just discussed here. And as a practitioner who, who works in that, I'm curious with sites like these that have these particular, uh, you know, sensitive issues and considerations. Are you find? Do you find that like? Dark heritage sites tend to kind of work together to, in order, like, is there is there communication 
that's kind of below the, like the general level preservation. You know, like these little agricultural bee seed things. Um, like, are, are there like small tricks and stuff that are being shared among sites that do have to do, you know, textile conservation in non um, not that I know of. Um, I think to the extent it exists, it's going to exist in the, the kind of professional and disciplinary silos that are already out there. Like if you wanted to know about textile conservation, I actually don't know where. Is there a journal of textile conservation? This was my first textile venture, and so Julia Brennan you know, led that whole part of the project. She has said many times, and I, you know, I've encouraged her greatly to publish this, um, so that people can see, you know, see what we did and decide whether it, it's useful or, or legitimate. Um, so I think at a technical level, there is, you know, there still is a use for publishing it. And given the digital tools we have, I think we could, you can find it if it was out there. Um, there are all, there are some organizations, and there's one in particular that works on. Um, there is kind of a network of um, negative heritage sites. It's called International. Not getting, um, Sites of Conscience, International Sites. International Sites. What he said. Yeah, and so Eastern State Penitentiary is a member of it. Uh, there are a bunch of Holocaust sites in, in Europe, uh, Cambodia. It's, it's global. They mostly focus on the, they don't focus on conservation issues or really design issues. It's mostly about uh, issues of reconciliation, um, transitional justice, and um, rebuild, social rebuilding. Um, but they, you know, they have been involved in preservation with a capital P. Uh, it's just not central to them. Yeah, I, I was just, as I was listening to you, seeing um, these um, sort of case studies as situations where you were going into a community and you're really kind of thinking about the needs of that community um, and, and, and in a larger environmental sense and stabilizing, you know, their environment. I mean, we call it preservation as well, but for, some, for me, some of this is really just stabilization as related to the particular needs of a particular community at the moment and then into the future. And uh, these environments, of course, have the value to conserve them as related to these needs you know, going forward. Uh, and it just reminded me, and I just wanted to ask you if you had ever given any thought to this, um, uh, John Carlo de Carlo, ages ago, I came to speak when I was a graduate student. Um, and and his, his, his talk was so compelling because he, he believed in participation. You know, that's where an architect starts, is by listening very carefully to the voice and getting on the ground, the voice of the community. And then you start to think about, about design. And so I'm sort of seeing a parallel here. You know, you, you listen to the, to the voices, and then you, you begin to think about how one conserves or how one stabilizes or yeah. goes forward from there. <laughs> I, mean, so I just wonder if you had any thoughts on John Collard or Carlo or any of that. I'll get to that in a second, but it, I think the thing that's more um, in, in the center of, of my plate, and I think everybody else's plate who I work with, is some idea about people-centered design, people-centered practice, uh, people-centered preservation. Some people call it uh, like, you know, uh, socially, there are a million names for it, um, socially engaged practice, et cetera. Um, so I think that that's, you know, that is a, um, an idea that has been out there for a while but never fully taken up. Um, Paul Davidoff in the planning, if, you're, if you ever study planning, you have to you read the 1965 article by Paul Davidoff who coined this idea of advocacy planning. The planners weren't just technical experts, they had to take a side and to, you know, to, and to pursue that and basically work like a lawyer. You have a client, you work for that client's interests. Um, so that's been out there for a while, and there are a lot of ways to take it up. Um, Sam Mockby and the, the Rural Studio, et cetera. Um, so I think that that's, that's, a, that's a really important part of, our, of all of our practices right now. On the Italian side, um, I started, um, uh, Nathan and I started talking about this, but this, this is work that you should finish. Um, I started studying uh, an Italian architect, planner, conservator, historian named Gustavo Giovanoni who was active in the first half of the 20th century. Almost nobody in this country knows him because his work was never translated. He stayed in Italy his whole life, et cetera. Fascinating work because he totally ignored boundaries. He did all this different, he intervened in, in, in all these different ways. Given that he worked in the first half of the 20th century, he didn't give a, a hoot about the people. The experts knew best. That's a post-war phenomenon. So his successors 
De Carlo, you know, uh, you know, maybe first among them, um, in the Italian tradition, which is this incredibly strong and clear and admirable tradition of urban conservation, um, there's a line that connects uh, Giovanoni uh, and uh, and De Carlo and the you know, and Pane and the people still working today. Um, that I think that would be a great um, retelling of that story, um, because the, you know the Italians are often remembered for being great designers, not great planners or community advocates. So that would be a great uh, project to research. The one thing I mean, um, you said the illustrator that preservation as it was practiced is certainly changed to include planning, community advocacy, and all the rest of it. So in terms of what you do, or in terms of what we should be doing, say educating students. I'm not sure we do enough to think about the economics, we talked about real estate at one point, or all these other factors that go into it, and we can't do everything. And you had mentioned this question about we still have boundaries as preservations. So I'm curious just to see, to ask what those boundaries are and what, how do we let the others into our, into our professions, or let us into other professions. Uh, that's the, that would be a perfect question at my PhD defense because it's totally unanswerable, but absolutely a, a, you know, the best question ever and the most important one to what we do every day. Um, so how, do you, how would we draw boundaries around preservation? Um, it, it would be hard pressed to actually draw the line, but I think you can imagine some conditions that should always be present, um, that certain conditions always being present would require someone with preservation expertise to work on it. So built heritage, um, you know, I, I like to think of the inherited environment as opposed to, because it, it, it also relates to natural environments, things that are not built by humans. Um, so, uh, you know, an understanding of the materiality, the evolution, uh, and the cultural meaning of those things. Um, that's something that touches on a lot of professions, but preservation is the one that centers on those things. Um, so I think that's, that's one thing that's always in the center of it. Um, I think being, you know, the idea the, the, the need to be a historian um, to be a preservationist, I think is really important because other fields use history. I should defer to Gail. But other fields use history, but preservationists have to also be historians. And that's why there's, you know, we get, believe me, we get pushback on it. Every first semester preservation student has to take the historical methods course and do the deed research and do the census research and do all the primary research to learn how to actually be an historian. Even if you don't do it your whole life, you have to appreciate um, the, you know, the kind of, uh, the contribution that that makes. So I think that's another, um, you know, sort of delimiting factor. Not that there's never an architect who also is a, a legitimate historian, um, but th the exceptions don't prove, prove my rule. Um, uh, and so I think that maybe those two are the, are the, I don't know the only two, but maybe the first two. I think there are ways. There, I think there are a whole range of ways to teach it to go to the easier to answer part of your question. Um, it's not. We don't need to have a course for every complication, um, and there are lots of ways to to make clear enough the the, the kind of core of the field, if not the boundaries, um, uh, through um, not just through lecturing about theories and cases, but also through method, uh, and then um, letting people encounter different problems in different places. And through the complications of you know, going to a studio site and interviewing people, elected officials, residents, et cetera, you realize some of the complications and you have to sort them out by not only, not just which one I have to pay attention to and which one I can ignore, but how those different ones um, you know, educate you differently. But you do have to prioritize the end of the world and the end of the day. Um, and the, you know, as with all kind of community participation work, um, we want to know from this community because they have intelligence we don't have, but we can't listen to them all the time. Sometimes we do things that they don't want, or we recommend things they don't want. So um, those complications, I think, can come from, uh, can be appreciated from a firm base. We argue all the time, and we've been, I think my faculty for 35 or 40 years has been arguing about what is the core. Believe me, every semester it seems like we, you know, we, 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 we open up that box again and try to tinker with it. I have a question. As preservation continues to change and adapt to its 
surroundings. Um, where do you see industrial transportation preservation um, being mixed in with building uh, preservation? I don't think in terms of buildings and bridges and land and parks and gardens is different. I think the uh, my assumption is that uh, we all need to be treated fundamentally the same way. You know, understand the materiality, their history, their you know the processes that by which they're you know they operate and work, uh, and then figure out from that you know the the calculus of what needs to be preserved, what can be preserved, and and how to how to design the change going forward. So I would uh, I would respectfully say that I wouldn't won't answer a specific bridge question just like I wouldn't answer a specific garden question uh, because there you know it's uh, I think the, the the kind of approach to to heritage and heritage conservation being taught today is rightfully not specific to type and increasingly less specific to culture I mean the kind of internationalization of of preservation is another you have a, an expert sitting in the front row here um, that's a very fraught um, but I, you know, I think big opportunity for the preservation. The one reason why I say uh, the one reason why I bring that up is I've worked with railroads and planes, trains, all nine yards, and it's often I've found the case is it's usually forgotten. It's like when I talk to a historian or I'll talk to someone else, their main focus is the building and the property itself, not let's say passenger car or let's say the aircraft itself but everything around it um, so that's where I kind of come from on that well yeah there is a bias uh, in preservation toward buildings and that you know interestingly that has not always been the case that basically happened in this country that happened you know in the basically early 20th century if you look at some of the other roots of preservation in the US they are in things like national parks and the movements that, that resulted in national parks. Um, there's a great, um, I subject uh, my students frequently to this essay from the 1830s by Thomas Cole, um, the name of which now eludes me, um, but he's basically talking about how um, nature is the substitute for buildings in American heritage um, because we don't have castles, we don't have abbeys, uh, we don't have great cathedrals. So, but we have waterfalls and mountains and et cetera, et cetera. So, um, you know, as you, we can all visualize that in his paintings, but that contributed a lot to the national park movement, what became the national park movement, which is all about cultural landscapes and only incidentally about buildings. Thank you, thanks.